Thank you, Dr. Jones. I count it a real honor to stand in this pulpit. It's occupied so often by the gentleman who just introduced me. Thank God for him and his tremendous ministry and his dear father, who is one of the best friends I ever had, as well as his son. And it's a real joy to be here. Now, this morning the scripture is found in Romans chapter 1. I shall begin at the first verse, and the first word, Paul. Not Saul, but Paul. His parents named him Saul. King Saul of the Old Testament stood a head and shoulders taller than anyone else in Israel. So his name came to signify big one. But this apostle of Jesus Christ preferred to call himself Paul, which means little one. You know, we have so many big shots in the ministry today. It's refreshing to find a man who calls himself little shot. Paul, little one, a servant of Jesus Christ. You know, there's something beautiful about servanthood. The Lord Jesus Christ was a servant. He took a towel and washed and wiped his disciples' feet. He said, Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly, and you shall find rest unto your souls. Think of his speaking of his yoke. You know what wears a yoke? Well, any contraption around the neck may be called a yoke, but the kind Jesus was talking about was the kind that's worn by two oxen. A yoke's made for two. Jesus said, Be my yoke fellow, in other words. I'll do the pulling for both of us. That'll make it easy for you. My yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Well, Paul spoke of himself as the servant of Jesus Christ, a lowly servant, a bond slave. The original word there would imply bond slave of Jesus Christ, one who has sold out to Jesus completely, an apostle of Jesus Christ. He was a servant, but he had a high calling. We don't have any apostles today, regardless of what some charlatan may call himself, or regardless of what some ecclesiastical potentate may be called. An apostle was one who was sent by Jesus in person. I heard two men claiming to be apostles in succession as I rode along, listened on the radio, and uh, they, they were just... Uh, men of our day, claiming that they were apostles, while the apostles were special. And they were sent by Jesus. And apostolic days closed when the word of God was completed, and certain things were no longer necessary. But Paul said, I'm an apostle of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle. Among whom are you also the call, he said down in verses 5 and 6. We're just as definitely called as were the apostles. We're not called to be apostles. I'm called an evangelist. Uh, Dr. Jones is called a minister of the gospel and president of this wonderful university. Uh, we're called. Uh, every Christian is called. Called to be saints. A saint is not someone who has been catechized by some ecclesiastical hierarchy a hundred years after he died. But a saint is one set apart. In Jesus Christ, every Christian is a saint. You've been set apart. You're being set apart as the Holy Spirit works in your life. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it that he might sanctify it by the washing of the water by the word and present it to himself a glorious church, having not spot or wrinkle or any such thing. One day the omniscient eyes of God will look us over, and he'll say, I don't see a spot, I don't see a wrinkle. We're saints now, set apart, we're being set apart, and we shall be set apart in the sense of complete conformity to Jesus Christ. So all Christians are called to be saints. We're called of Jesus Christ. Some are called pastors. Some are called to be missionaries. And maybe God has called some of you to the mission field who have not yet surrendered to that call. But Paul said, I'm a servant of Jesus Christ, separated under the gospel of God. Say, so that's the kind of separation I like. 
Separation unto. Not just separated from. Of course you can't be separated unto without being separated from certain things. For the word separate itself implies that you're a separate from certain things. So we are called, of course, to be separated Christians and separate unto the gospel of God. That solves a lot of problems for me. Problems of morality, problems of worldliness. The Bible says, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. For if any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. That's what the Apostle John said, who leaned upon the breast of Jesus at the Last Supper. And the Apostle James, under divine inspiration, said, Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know you not that friendship with the world is enmity with God? And he that would be a friend of the world is the enemy of God? So it settles problems of worldliness as far as I'm concerned. And it settles ecclesiastical problems. I don't believe in preaching the gospel from the pulpit and then paying somebody or putting my offerings or my tithe into a uh, an organization that will support institutions that teach what I preach is false. Well, that's foolish. Down in Alabama, we have a, an asylum where they have a certain test. They'll take an inmate out of a low department, give him a mop, turn on the water, and tell him to mop the water off of the floor. If he has enough gumption to shut off the faucet, they promote him. But if he tries to mop the water off of the floor with a spigot open, they put him right back in the department he came out of. And yet there are a lot of people who preach the Word of God from the pulpit, believe it, but then pay some denominational program to teach what he's preaching is false. Oh, they don't do that openly, but they do it in seminaries and colleges. And uh, I don't believe in working against yourself that way. That's foolish. But separate unto the gospel of God. That settles it. It's unto the gospel of God. And how wonderful is this gospel? Paul describes it thusly. And he, of course, says much else about it elsewhere. But he says, The gospel of God, which he promised afore by his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. And if all I had to prove the deity of Christ, or the, 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 the inspiration of this book, would be to study the development of that seed promised to Adam in the Garden of Eden, and trace the lineage of Jesus through his foster father Joseph and through his virgin mother in the book of Luke. That's all I'd need, how these things dovetail in Jesus Christ. And he's made of the seed of David according to the flesh. He's the rightful heir to the throne of David. He's the long-promised Messiah. That's part of the gospel concerning his son, our Lord Jesus Christ, which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh and declared to be the son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by his resurrection from the dead. I could give you many arguments for the deity of Christ. I think they're, they're really proofs of the deity of Christ. He bears all the marks of deity and and his wonderful works while he was here. Um, there's no other explanation for Jesus than he's the Son of God. But he's proven to be the Son of God by his resurrection. That's the great proof of the deity of Christ. And there's more proof that Christ arose from the dead than there is that Augustus Caesar ever lived. That's the statement that caused the great historian Neander to shed tears when he heard it. He knew it was true. Christ is a risen Savior. We have a living Christ. Paul said, I'm separated under that gospel. Now, he didn't ask, what will it cost to follow Jesus? He just said, I'm separated unto it. I've burned the bridges behind me. I've had my ear worn through with an awl. I'm a bond slave of Jesus Christ. See, a bond slave was one who was set free, but he wanted to remain with his master. And according to Leviticus, he was to go to his master and tell him, his master would take him to a post and take a little leather putcher, called an awl, A-W-L, and bore through it, through his ear, put it against a post and bore through it. That would signify that he is his bond slave forever. That's what Paul said. I'm his bond slave forever. So he'll call the signals. I'll run with the ball. I'll do what he tells me. 
I belong to Him. I'm His bond slave. And I'm separated unto that gospel. And he went out and did a great missionary work. God called him to be a missionary. He was an apostle, but a missionary. He was at the church in Antioch in Syria. And uh, there were several prophets there. And the Holy Spirit said to them, Set me apart, Barnabas and Saul, for the work whereunto I have called them. And when they had fasted and prayed, they laid their hands upon them and sent them away. Now notice, they fasted and prayed and sent them away. But the next verse says, And they being sent by the Holy Spirit, departed unto the Lucius, and from thence they sailed to Cyprus. God used those apostles and prophets and the church at Antioch to send them away. And the Holy Spirit sent them away. And they were led by the Spirit, and they went down to Cyprus, and they had uh, success down there. But they went from there up to, up to Asia Minor. And everywhere they went in Asia Minor on this journey, they, they founded a church. That's the kind of visions I, uh, we stand for. Uh, we thank God for other works, but we, we are in the soul-winning church planning ministry. Uh, that's the way Paul and Barnabas did it. They went up to Antioch in Pisidia. And there they preached, and they had to leave town because their gospel was rejected by many. But they went over to Iconium and to Derby. Same thing happened. They went over to Lystra, and they were dragged. Uh, Paul was dragged out of town, left for dead. They stoned them, and they left him on the side of the road. But he and Barnabas went back. He got up, and God raised him up. They went back into the city and ordained elders, ordained pastors indicating they had found a church there. They went back to Derby and to Iconium and ordained pastors, back to Antioch in, in Pisidia. And then they went back to Antioch in Syria and gave their report. And they went down to Jerusalem, and, and the apostles all agreed that uh, God's purpose in this age was the gathering out of a people for His name and among the Gentiles. And the Gentiles did not have to be circumcised and obligate themselves to the law, because that was a yoke that the Jews were not able to bear, and they wouldn't lay that yoke upon the Gentile Christians, but they would ref be advised to refrain from immorality, from things strangled and offered to idols of fornication. And, of course, uh, they had the spirit of the law written in their hearts. The Old Testament law was a schoolmaster to bring them to Christ. But Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. Not the end of the law for those who do not believe. It, it condemns the unbeliever. A man called me up on a, a talkback uh, show, as they call it, on the radio up in Illinois. He said, uh, Why is it all you Bible-believing Christians seem to believe in capital punishment? Well, I said, Sir, you just answered your question. We're Bible-believing Christians. Oh, but he said that was the Old Testament. We're not under law. We're under grace. But I said, If you're not a Bible-believing Christian... And you've heard the law, friend, you're under law. Christ is in the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. God's written the law of love in our hearts, made us new creatures, and imparted the Holy Spirit to us, to guide us. And, and so we're not under that Old Testament law, which uh, is the inexorable law of God. He did not abrogate the law when Jesus died on the cross. Jesus fulfilled it wrote in the hearts of all believers. But uh, we have Him in our hearts, and we have God's righteous will in our hearts. All right, Paul and Barnabas then went back. The Barnabas went over to Cyprus, and uh, Paul went back on his second journey. And how he suffered, everywhere he went he was persecuted. He stayed down in Corinth 18 months and uh, pastored the church he built, made tents to pay his own way. fact is, before he went there, he got over to Troas. He had wanted to go down to, to Ephesus and was hindered by the Holy Spirit. And he essayed to go into Bithynia, but the Holy Spirit hindered him. And he had a vision. He saw a man over in Macedonia saying, Come over into Macedonia and help us. And the next day he embarked for Macedonia. God so often leads by opening doors in front of us. And he got over there and was put in jail after he won a lady, a woman to Christ who, with whom 
Um, people were making merchandise. And they threw him in jail, but he prayed the jailhouse down. He had solace with him. They prayed the jailhouse down, converted the jailer, turned his house into a church. Later he wrote the epistle to the Philippians, to that church. And then he went over to Thessalonica. There he was sorely persecuted, but he left the church there. We have two epistles to the church in Thessalonica. He went then to Berea, over to Berea. And the men there were more noble than those of Thessalonica. They at least searched the Old Testament to see whether he's preaching the truth. And uh, they found out the New Testament is a commentary on the Old Testament, though it had not been completed when Paul preached it. But he had to get out of town to save his life. And they who conducted Paul brought him down to Athens, and there he stood on Mars Hill and preached. He went down the street, and there were so many idols and images and people worshiping these false gods. He just started preaching on the street. And they took hold of him and dragged him up on Mars Hill, where he could stand there and look across the way and see the Parthenon, where they worshiped the virgin, the word Parthenos meaning virgin. Not the Virgin Mary, of course, but the, the, the Virgin Athena, the goddess of Athens. And uh, they had many other gods and goddesses too. And he preached that wonderful ser sermon in the 17th chapter of Acts. And uh, the chief of the Supreme Court, the chief Areopagite, was converted. And uh, he did not found the church there as far as we know, but he at least had some converts and left them there. And later... The church was founded, but he was just on his way down to Corinth, which was a great city between the east and the west down there. And he went down to Corinth and stayed 18 months. And as I said, he, he made his own living down there. And yet he wrote later and said to those down in verse, uh, verse 14, he said, I'm debtor both to the Greeks and to the barbarians. Why, it seems like they were debtors to him. But I'm a debtor. Why, he felt that he was a debtor because he was a bond slave of Jesus Christ. And he was a debtor to Jesus, so he felt a debtor to all people. And he went on to say, so I'm ready to bring the gospel to you there at Rome. He felt a debtor to Rome, too, to the barbarians. He said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it's the power of God and the salvation. For the Jew first, and also the Greek. He had seen it work among the prejudiced Jews in Asia Minor, and the Greeks there, and also in Macedonia and Greece proper. And he said it's the power of God and the salvation to every, notice, every one that believeth. He didn't say it'll change Rome. He didn't say it's a social gospel. It did change Rome, but by changing individuals. That's what the gospel will do. To every one that believeth. Jew first and also the Greek. So I'm not ashamed to bring it to Rome. I've seen it work in Greece, the center of culture and education, the center of art. I believe it will work in Rome, the center of power, ecclesiastical and military and governmental power. It will work there. And he went down there and preached it and it worked even while he was in prison. He wrote and said, I thank God that through these bonds, salvation's coming to Caesar's household. He went there as a prisoner, and he was in his own hired house for about two years, but chained to soldiers. He'd have to drag the chain across the pavement. Say, come over a little closer, buddy, and give me room to write. I've been praying for you. Why don't you give that little baby a Christian daddy? lead a man to Christ to whom he is chained. And uh, the next shift he'd get another one. And then we think he went to Spain and came back and was in that Mamertine prison. That's where he died. It's a dungeon. You stand on a stone floor. Uh, the first time I was down there, we had about 60 people in our party. And uh, there was not room for us to... Well, we just stood against each other. Well, let me give you the verse I quoted there, it was too dark in there to read some little dim 40-watt bulbs in four little niches where they used to have those little clay lamps in Paul's day. You see, Paul spent his last days in that prison, and that's where he wrote, I am now ready to be offered in the time of my departures at hand. I've fought a good fight. I've finished the course. I've kept the faith. Say, 
he fought a good fight. You know, there are a lot of people who keep the faith but won't fight for Jesus. They won't take it. And some who fight a little while get all fed up and throw in the towel. But Paul said, I've finished my course. And I've kept the faith. And I've fought for it. And there's laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day. And not to me only, but unto all them also that love is appearing. And that's an implication that if one truly loves his appearing, he'll fight a good fight and finish the course and keep the faith. He'll deserve that crown if he truly loves his appearing. A lot of people think they love the coming of Jesus when they simply have a morbid curiosity about some of the details of the tribulation. But if you love his appearing, you'll fight a good fight and finish the course. You love him and you want him to come into his own and your love is appearing because you love him. You'll keep the faith and fight a good fight and finish the course. And Paul said, I'm ready to be offered. And he took Paul out of there and cut his head off a few days after he wrote that. And I quoted that. And I called on an old mountain preacher leading prayer. And he got down on his knees. And this old preacher's heart was touched. And he got down there and he, he couldn't pray. He said, Lord, this is what we come for. This is what we come for. And then he stopped and I led in prayer. And then he got up and made a very classical statement. You English teachers will be interested in trying to parse this. But he said, Remember that Jesus Christ of the seed of David, that's one of the things he mentioned about the gospel of God, of the seed of David was raised from the dead, and that's the other, according to my gospel, which I suffer trouble as an evildoer, but the word of God is not bound. He had been faithful and had preached it through the years. And we too are debtors, debtors to God. We're debtors to the barbarians. We're debtors to the Greeks. We're debtors to the Jews. We're debtors to Americans. We're debtors to the world. Because we belong to Jesus. We're not our own. We're bought with a price. Now, we can't repay Jesus. In the bundle of the Savior's sufferings, every needful pang was born. Sharing, rude, scoffing. Jesus paid it all. There's no outstanding remnant for which we must pay. But Jesus died for our sins. But Paul said, I fill up that which is behind in the afflictions of Christ. You see, a story needs a teller. An evangel must have an evangelist. A gospel calls for a preacher. This message demands a missionary to take it to the world. So, we're debtors to all men because we're debtors to Jesus. And Paul considered himself a debtor because he had the complete revelation of God. So do we in this book. And God had revealed some things to Paul that he explained. And they're here. And we have we understand God's program for this age. You have God's word. And then he considered himself a debtor because he was had that high calling. So do you. We're called to be saints, and it's the saints that do the work of the ministry. When Jesus ascended on high he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men, some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers. And I separate them, though some like to say pastor-teachers, who believe in ruling teachers, ruling elders, rather. But pastors and teachers, some are called to teach, we are not called a pastor. And he calls Laban to witness, ye shall be witnesses unto me. And that means y'all, that word ye means y'all. You all shall be witnesses unto me. And uh, we are debtors because we belong to him and because we're called. And because of this, this wicked world that's in darkness. And we have the light of life. May God lay it on the heart of every one of us to give ourselves to this gospel of Jesus Christ. In one way or another, God uses laymen. Call some to be doctors and school teachers and, and lawyers. Well, I know a few. He calls a few of the lawyers. Uh, 
He may call them all, but some don't answer. Thank God for a lot of statesmen. But He calls people in various walks of life to serve Him. May God bless you day by day as you study to be more effective witnesses. And you certainly will here at Bob Jones University. Let us stand for the closing prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank Thee for these wonderful students who have come, some of them in spite of opposition, various kinds of opposition. We thank Thee they have the character and the courage to come on because they have felt the touch of God in their lives. Bless them all. Help each one to seek Thy will for his life. We thank Thee for a dedicated, godly faculty capable one. How we thank thee for Bob Jones University and for our leaders. We thank thee for the doctors Jones. And uh, we pray that thou will give them strength day by day. What a burden they have. What a task they have. And we pray that thou will undergird them each step of the way. Keep us all faithful. Lead us by thy spirit as we go from hence. We pray in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.